But this morning, I'd like us to move somehow a little beyond that. I think sometimes in the church, we can focus so often on brokenness that we miss sometimes the call to forget about our brokenness, trust the Lord with it, and move forward. See, a song like that's not only true when we're going through difficult times. That song is also true when God's calling us to new areas of risk, to new areas of service, to new areas of sacrifice. We need God to move mountains, not only in dark times, but also in challenging times where he's calling us to more as regards mission and service. That's why we're studying the book of Acts together last fall, last spring, this fall. We want to learn from the first century church who are we supposed to be in our day. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. And we're going to learn this morning the key, and I know that's said too often perhaps, but we're going to learn this morning truly the key to the world-changing fruitfulness of the first century church. It was a key that Jesus himself modeled. It was a key that Jesus himself left behind. Jesus worked with 12, but 11 faithful men. And he gave them what is called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 said, go into all the world and make disciples. But what he says before that is key. He says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples. The key to the world-changing power of the first century church was they understood and embraced Christ's call to go and make disciples. The 11 entrusted what Christ had entrusted to them to others, who entrusted what they had entrusted to them to others, and so on and so forth. And this is the only way we're going to reach the world for Christ. This is the only way we're going to see the world transformed by the renewing power of the gospel. Spiritual multiplication. That is the key to the fruitfulness of of the church. My story deeply involves this key that Jesus gave to the church. I was a sophomore at Penn State. As far as I know, I had never heard the gospel. My God at the time was basketball. I saw a group of Christian athletes play basketball, but also share the gospel. I said I wanted to understand more of about what it meant to be a Christian because I realized I didn't really know. A guy came to my fraternity house. He went through a little yellow booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws. And at the end, after he explained the gospel to me, he said, Do you, have you ever personally trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? I said, no, I didn't even know how to do that or that I was supposed to. He said, would you like to right now? And I said, absolutely. And right there in my fraternity room, I gave my life to Christ. The guy who led me to Christ then began taking me through some, some Bible studies and material that would ground me in my faith and taught me how to read the Bible on my own and, and plugged me into a local church. And my fraternity brothers noticed that my life was changing and they said, what is going on with you? And I didn't know. And I said, the funny thing is, it all started when somebody read me this little yellow book called The Four Spiritual Laws. And they said, will you read it to us? And I said, well, I guess so. I don't even know what's on the other page. So I read them The Four Spiritual Laws, the gospel presentation. At the end, I said, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior and Lord? I didn't know to say that. It was written in the booklet. And they said, no, we've never done that. I said, would you like to? They said, of course we would. And guys in my fraternity have started giving their lives to Christ. I went back to the guy that led me to Christ. And I said, what do I do now? After getting up off the ground, fainting, he got back up. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. The things I'm about to pass to you, you go ahead a week later and pass on to them. Now listen, I didn't know anything. I was a brand new Christian. I was literally one week ahead of the guys that I was leading. And that's exciting. 
That's the excitement I long for all of you because I need to tell you multiplying discipleship is not for the professionals only. Some of the best disciple makers I've ever met and been around are lay people who have other vocations than what we would call ministry. They're not professionals. They're not clergy. And the beautiful thing that Jesus says to us is all authority has been given to me, therefore go. It doesn't depend, depend upon your giftedness. It doesn't depend even about how much training you've received. If you trust Christ and are growing in Christ, there are people all around us who long to be discipled or mentored. And that is how the church will change the world. Luke tells the story of the first century church very intentionally. You got to understand that. When, when Luke writes the book of Acts, he's not merely giving you history. He's not merely giving you uh, a recorded story of what happened. He's doing it with an agenda. He's doing it with a purpose. Luke is writing down the history of the first century church so that we might learn eternal principles from the first century church and that we might apply those principles in our day. And one of those principles... The key to impact in our lives is multiplying discipleship. Let's all stand out of the reverence for God's word. I'm going to read Acts 14, 8 through 23. This is God's word. Now at Lystra, and again, remember from last week, we're still talking about cities in what are now southern Turkey. Okay, so uh, Paul began his journey uh, in Syria, in Antioch, which is north of Israel. He sailed west to Cyprus, the island. Then he went through the island, east to west. And then he went north, sailed north, and he landed in Turkey. And then he went inland in Turkey, and one of these cities was Lystra. At Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed the, all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant and authoritative word. This is God's word, his very word. And he's given it to us because he loves us and because he wants us to be a people who are disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. 
Let's pray. Father, would you unpack this passage for us by your Holy Spirit? Again, Lord, soften our hearts, open our eyes, move our wills. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. If you were following closely, and I tried to emphasize the words as I read, three times in this text, Christians are called disciples. Verse 21, verse 22, verse 23. If I'd have read to the end of the chapter, the word disciples occurs again. The word disciple or disciples occurs over and over and over in the four gospels and the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, 261 times the word disciple or disciples is used in the gospels and the book of Acts. And Christ is very clear as he gives his definition that the only kind of disciple he's talking about is a multiplying disciple. For instance, it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but when fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, when we think of fully trained in discipleship, we often think in terms of character qualities. We think of holy behaviors. We think of godly ethics. And clearly, those things are included. But what is also included in a disciple when fully trained is like his teacher is being a disciple maker. That's what Jesus did. He banked the whole transformation of the world on churches that would disciple disciple makers. So that's how we have an impact in the world. Uh, downstairs uh, in the coffee bar outside of it, you'll find our mission, vision, values. And our, our vision is to engage every neighbor with the surprising power of grace. And of course, there's an outreach element to engaging every neighbor, but there's also a mentoring or discipleship element to engaging every neighbor with grace. And one of our measures, one of the things we're gonna sort of hold our feet to the fire on in this church is we want to trust the Spirit to work through the church so that you all would experience surprising impact through your lives. And one of the ways to have surprising impact is to multiply your impact through disciple making. Three elements this morning that flow out of this text. First of all, multiply your impact by being equipped to evangelize. Now, as soon as I say that word evangelize, what passes through your heads? What emotions do you experience? What happens in your gut? See, so often when the church talks about becoming more evangelistic in our lives, people feel covered up with guilt. They feel shame. They feel under the pile. They feel they can't do it. They feel they don't have what it takes, but they know they should do it. And you know what? That is exactly what the devil wants you to feel. The lie of the devil is you don't have what it takes. The lie of the devil is you don't have enough training. Another lie of the devil is people just aren't interested. Well, look at verses 8 through 11. Notice that through the presence of a crippled man, God creates an opportunity for evangelism. Matter of fact, Luke in the gospel and in the book of Acts is constantly taking pains to tell the story of the first century church in such a way that we learn this important principle. God is always at work around you all the time. Do you hear that? God is always at work around you all the time. God is setting up divine appointments for all of us that we might engage every neighbor with a surprising power of grace, even when it comes to evangelism. One way to join God in his work of grace, winning the nations, is to have the proper attitude about evangelism. I fear that so many of us have an attitude when we hear about evangelism that says, oh no, not that. But I'm here to tell you, Luke through the spirit is saying, when you hear someone talk, call you to evangelism, you should say, oh yeah, let's do it. The reason being the word evangelism literally means good news. 
See, the world would have you to believe we have no right to push our opinions on other people. We have no right to force our religion on other people. That religion's personal and private. We have no right to talk about it. And guess what? We've believed people when they've told us that. And so Luke takes great pains in this passage to reveal that evangelism is one thing. It is the good news, the best news people could possibly hear about the good God, the creator God, who offers salvation through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8. I want you to notice something very interesting about this verse. The man could not use his feet. Okay, I get it. No, he was crippled from birth. Yeah, you just said that. No, no, he had never walked. Yeah, you've said that three times now. Why do you suppose Luke was inspired by the Spirit to say that three times? Because Luke was trying to emphasize the man's situation was hopeless. And the spiritual application is that all the people who come into contact with who don't know Jesus are just as hopeless and just as helpless. That guy could do nothing to make himself walk. And people without Christ can do nothing to get themselves to salvation. And that only God through the gospel can save people. So we're not pushing our views on people. We are offering hopeless people hope. We're offering helpless people salvation. Why would we not want to do that? Regardless of what other people say we're doing, we are offering the hopeless hope. And then when you think people aren't interested, look at verse 9. The crippled man listened to Paul, and Paul saw he had faith to be made well. There are people out there who are very interested. Look, I'm one of them. A sophomore basketball player, frat boy. Who could be less interested in the gospel than that? And I was dying to come to Christ, and I didn't even know it. There are people you work around, people your kids play around, your neighbors, family members. There are people that do want to know Christ because God has prepared their hearts. Even in situations where there's great misunderstanding, there's opportunity to share the good news. Look at verses 11 to 15. Have you wondered why that's in there? People think that that Paul is Hermes and Barnabas is Zeus. Why are we being told those details? Well, you need to understand that about 50 years before Paul and Barnabas came on the scene, there was a Roman poet. His name was Ovid. And Ovid wrote about the Roman gods that parallel the Greek gods. So the Roman supreme god was Jupiter, and the Greek supreme god was Zeus. So that was Barnabas. And then Jupiter's son was named Mercury. He was a talker. And, of course, Zeus's son was named Hermes, and he was the talker. Now, why bring that up? Why would they think that as soon as Paul healed this crippled man? Well, Ovid in the story says that, that Jupiter and Mercury had visited these towns. And nobody recognized them. Nobody showed hospitality to them. They were about to destroy all the cities with a flood when this elderly couple invited them in and showed them great hospitality. And Jupiter and Mercury, again, Zeus and Hermes in the Greek world, showed these people great blessings, prospered these old people, and all the other people of the cities, the gods wiped out with a flood. So when they saw this lame person healed, they thought, "Uh uh-oh, it's happening again. But this time, this time we're going to prosper. This time we're going to recognize who these people are. These men are the gods. They're Zeus and and they're Hermes. They've come back to give us a second chance. And we are not going to be caught with a flood this time. See, they were filled with superstition. They were filled with fear. They were filled with works and performance mentalities. And Paul says in verse 15, what are you doing? We're just people like you. 
but we're offering good news that you should turn from these vain, worthless things to the living God. Folks, that's what evangelism is. It's not pushing your views on people. It's offering people who have given themselves to vain, worthless idols. This is the true and living God, and you can know him. I'm a man just like you. And the only reason I'm able to share this good news is because somebody shared it with me. If you had a cure for AIDS, for cancer, for Alzheimer's, would you just sit on it? If you have cancer and you knew absolutely there was a cure and you took it and you were cured, would you just go about your life and say, oh, wow, that was nice? Or would you go to every single person who had cancer and said, hey, I got a cure. It's 100%. It it never fails. Why would we stand silent? (laughs) Can I be honest? Why would I stand silent the way I do? Why don't I shout it from the rooftops? Why don't I ask every single person? I, why don't I talk to the bank teller and my server at lunch and uh, the people at Dick's Sporting Goods? Why, why am I not constantly just saying, do you know Jesus? I don't care if you think I'm an idiot. Do you know Jesus? Because I can offer you good news. I can offer you the best news you've ever heard in your life. I can offer you a way out of spiritual death. I can offer you a way from vain gods to an intimate relationship with the living God of the universe. Oh, what are you, nuts? I don't care. Okay, fine. I'll go to the next person. What, what do I care what people think? It is or is not the greatest thing that's ever happened to you than being introduced to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Is that or is not the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Well, okay, now we got some soul searching to do, right? Maybe it hasn't been. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the living God of the universe? There is nothing better. Then why wouldn't we offer the best thing that ever happened to any of us to other people? Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Talk about these things in your small groups, your life groups, your battle groups, your your Bible studies. Talk about these things. Who Who are you sharing your faith with? How are you getting to know unchurched people? What are you doing to get out of the church and into the world? Not be of the world, but be in the world. What are you doing? What are you doing to increase your opportunity for sharing your faith? Talk about, and listen, your attitude about sharing your faith is is a whole lot more important than any presentation you use. Presentation, you can can use any one of a dozens. Just, I promise you this, because I've done it. Just Google how to witness. Just Google it. You'll get dozens and dozens and dozens of recommendations of how you can share your faith. I don't care how you share your faith. I just care that we share our faith. I use the four laws. I don't. I don't see anything wrong with them. I think they're wonderful. But whatever, use what you can. But your attitude, is evangelism, oh no, not again. Or is it, oh yeah, I need to be reminded of this. This is the best thing I could ever share with anybody. Talk about Alabama score. Who cares? Well, I know my audience. Talk about Auburn score. But what about talking about Jesus? Secondly, multiply your impact by being equipped to establish. Look, it's one thing to lead people to Christ. It's another thing to establish people in their faith. Notice that Jesus didn't say go into all the world and make converts. He never said that. He said go into all the world and make disciples. And particularly, disciple-making disciples. Look at verse 21. Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Anak. Now, what's interesting is we we just learned a couple verses earlier that it was people from those cities that actually came and stoned Paul and stoned him so severely, he was so bloodied, bruised, and unconscious that they dragged him out of the city, they left him for dead. Paul says, after getting up, let's go back to those cities where those people came from. And then what did they do? 
Notice, they did four things to establish these new believers in their faith. Verse 22, they strengthened the souls of the disciples. How do you strengthen the soul of a disciple? How do you strengthen a soul? By the way, you do realize here, there's no difference in terminology between a believer and a disciple. If you're a believer, by definition, in Jesus' eyes, you're a disciple, which means you're supposed to be fully trained and become like your master, which means you are to become a disciple maker. Well, the first thing they need to be established in their faith is strengthening of their souls. What does that mean? Young believers, immature believers, need to be strengthened in grace, right? The Christian life seems initially very exciting until we experience failure, until we experience, you know what, I, this isn't fixing me as quickly as I thought it would. Like I'm still wrestling with sin. And you new, young, immature believers need to be strengthened in grace. They need to understand what does it mean to have God as your father? What does it mean to have a loving, forgiving, merciful God as your God? What does it mean to understand your standing and status? We talked earlier with Walter and Stephanie and Oliver, right? The, the adoption. What does it mean to be adopted into God's family, to be loved by him as much as he loves Jesus Christ himself? That's what it means. And to establish them, strengthen their souls in grace. We all need that and we all need to be equipped to do that. Again, verse 22. Secondly, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Now, in the Greek, that's, a, that's an articular uh, object. It's the faith. It's not just the faith. It's the faith. It's talking about a settled body of doctrine, a settled body of beliefs, a settled body of very important behaviors. That's what the faith is. So they encourage them in the faith. New Christians, immature Christians, young Christians need to understand basic doctrine about Christ. What it means, again, to be a Christian. And also, what it means to grow as a Christian. That's what this gentleman did with me at Penn State. He taught me how to read the Bible on my own. He taught me how to get plugged into a local church. He taught me how to pray. And then I was involved in church and I was involved in the fellowship of believers. And my life began to change. We need to encourage people to continue in the faith. Then look at number three in verse 22, saying that true, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. How many of us, when we think about establishing new Christians, talk about this? And yet Jesus would say it's one of the main reasons people who profess faith fall away. They're, they don't know this. They don't know that the Christian life doesn't free us from suffering, but in many ways actually brings it on. Remember the parable of the soils? Matthew 13. One of the soils was on rocky places and there was no real room for root, so it received the word and the seed and grew, sprung up immediately. And then the sun came out and beat down with heat and it scorched the seed and the sapling so that it died. And Jesus goes on to interpret it as that's what happens to people who immediately when they hear the gospel think, oh, this is great. And they receive the word with joy. But then trial, tribulation, and suffering comes. And because they have no root, they fall away. One of the most dangerous elements for young believers, immature believers in our day is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. One of the most dangerous doctrines out there that we need to deal with. This whole idea, come to Jesus and everything will be fine. Come to Jesus and you'll have no more problems. Come to Jesus, you'll have no more pain. Come to Jesus, you have nothing but health, wealth, and prosperity. And then when reality hits that reveals what a lie that ridiculous stuff is, people fall away because they're disillusioned. They thought, well, I didn't think it was going to happen to me. They're, I must not be a Christian or this Christian life doesn't work or God must hate me or what's wrong with me that God isn't treating me with prosperity and people fall away. And then fourthly, in verse 23, they appointed elders for them in every church. 
one of the critical elements, we talked about this last week, of establishing a new, young, or immature believer is to get them connected with a local church. Care of a newborn is critical. If you leave a newborn on its own, it will die. Lauren, I've seen that afresh with newborn pups as she raises these, these golden retrievers. Uh, she's on duty 24-7 the first two weeks. If they're not getting constant watch care, some of them are going to die. Now, in the nature of things, they, they do die if they're out there on their own. The, the mom just can't handle everything that happens, the mother dog. So Laurie is there. Okay? If, if newborn pups need that kind of care, how much more do those of us young in the faith need that kind of care as well. We can equip you with the tools to establishing new, young, immature believers. Multiply your impact by being equipped to evangelize, being equipped to establish. And then thirdly, multiply your impact by being equipped to equip. Again, discipleship is not coming to Christ and leading a Bible study. <laughs> not there's anything wrong with Bible studies, but that's not discipleship. A Bible study is a transference of knowledge. Discipleship is a transference of life. And it's a transference of life with a vision to help somebody learn to transfer life to other people who will transfer life. That's the difference between a Bible study and discipleship. So again, look at verse 21. They returned to Lystra. Now that's actually a key phrase because we find out in Acts 16, 1 through 3, that one of the people that was from Lystra, was this guy named Timothy. Now, Timothy was different than other people uh, that Paul had evangelized and established at Lystra by returning to Lystra. See, Timothy, we find out, grew up in a Christian home. Timothy's, Timothy's grandmother was a Christian. Timothy's mother was a Christian. And then Timothy became a Christian. Timothy was raised in the Scriptures from the time he was little. Timothy didn't really need to be established he was already mature. Timothy needed to be equipped. Timothy needed to be equipped with the vision of being a disciple who's a disciple maker, of people who become disciple makers. And guess what? That's exactly what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He said, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, those things entrust to faithful people. Who in turn will be able to entrust them to even more faithful people? And so on and so forth. To be equipped is to be equipped with the vision and the skills to equip other people to evangelize, establish, and equip other people who will evangelize, establish, and equip other people. And folks, that is the only way we're going to reach the Lord for Christ. The only way. We could plant churches that don't disciple from now to the cows come home and we will not reach the world for Christ. But if we plant churches that are disciple-making churches, we could reach the world's population in 30 years. Think about that. If every person in here shared their faith and every year only two people came to Christ and then you established those two people and equipped those two people and then we did that and planted churches that did that. And then they also went out and shared their faith and two people came to Christ and they established and equipped them. And those people did that in 30 years. We could reach the entire world's population. That's called exponentialism. That was Christ's key to founding the first century church. And it needs to become our key again. I told you about my time at Penn State. What I didn't tell you is what God did. There was a guy, one of those guys I talked about, said, read me that book. His name was Carl. Uh, Carl ended up joining the staff of Saddleback Community Church out near L.A. and was the singers pastor, the singles pastor underneath Rick Warren. And then Carl became the president of the International Bible Society. And then Carl became the president of Open Doors which is a mission ministry to the persecuted church around the world. I never had any idea anything would happen. I wasn't doing it for that. Carl was a guy I had loved 
and he was as hungry as I was. And I was just available, and God took over. And look what happened. Another guy that was in that group was named Mark. Uh, Mark ended up going into politics. He was uh, a senior Republican senator's chief of staff for years. He ended up meeting with Bono of U2 and President George W. Bush. And they struck a deal together to fight for uh, AIDS relief in Africa, for the forgiveness of third world debt, something that Bono still talks about, saying that Bush was the most courageous president he's ever met. And the guy that I had the privilege of establishing and equipping was the guy who put it together. I had no idea. You see, the last thing we see in the text here is that Paul and Barnabas, verse 23, committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. When it comes to discipleship and making disciples, more is dependent upon God's power than your ability. More is dependent upon God's faithfulness than even you being faithful. Really, all you need to be is available. I was a student. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know the books of the Bible. I'd only owned a Bible for two weeks. I was one week ahead of these guys. And yet look at how God multiplied my impact. And I want you to experience that excitement as well. Some of us are wondering, why are we here? Great question. Look, if the Christian life is all about getting to heaven, then why don't you go to heaven when you are converted? Why are you here? Because God's got a lot more for you to do. He's got a lot more he wants you to experience. We get retired. It's not about how much fun can we have. Well, actually, maybe it is. Discipleship is a blast. But you've made it through to your retirement years. You've got so much experience, so much knowledge, so much to offer. Dawson Troutman was the founder of Navigators. It was, began in the armed forces and then spread to campuses. Whenever Dawson Troutman spoke, he would look sometimes with a very uncomfortable pause in silence. And he'd look at every man and every woman. And he'd say, men, where are your men? Who's your Timothy? Who's your Titus? Where are your men? And he'd look at the ladies and he'd say, ladies, where are your women? Where are they? Where's your Mary? Where's your Priscilla? Where are your women? The key to renewing and transforming the world is multiplying discipleship. Are you game? Let's pray. Father, um, this could be overwhelming, and yet because of what Jesus said, that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth, because of what Paul reminds us of uh, through Luke, that uh, we are committed uh, to the care of the one in whom we've believed, uh, the pressure's off, and we don't need to listen to the lie. We can't do this. We can, because you can. And so, God, might we offer ourselves afresh to Jesus. Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Christ, well, then help them be evangelized today. God, if there's anybody here who's a brand new Christian, help them be established. And God, for everyone else, might you equip us to evangelize and establish and equip. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.